Hello, I'm Matt Galloway, and this is The Current Podcast. Freight trains and some commuter trains across Canada have come to a grinding halt. The train, it takes me one hour, but if I have to take my car, like it's two hours straight. You are giving me nightmares right at the beginning of this day. I think now I don't need my coffee, uh, like uh, you have taken, uh, you have woken me up. For the first time, Canada's two biggest rail companies have ch- have shut down simultaneously, affecting businesses and commuters. Both Canadian National and Canadian Pacific Kansas City declared a work stoppage, locking out thousands of unionized workers at one minute past midnight. The disruptions are immediate and they are big. From people trying to get to work to large industries like agriculture and manufacturing, the domino effect is already being felt across the country. Nisha Patel is a senior business reporter for CBC News. Good morning, Nisha. Good morning. So put this into perspective for us. How significant is it for both of these rail companies to go on a work stoppage at the same time? Well, it's never happened before. Normally, the railways negotiate labor contracts a year year apart. Now, these two companies dominate the rail network. They operate 75% of tracks across the country. All those freight trains aren't running and goods aren't moving. So if a shutdown continues for two weeks, that could be a $3 billion hit to GDP this year at a time when the economy is already slow. So the impact builds the longer it drags on. But a key point to note here is that this is not a strike where employees are walking off the job. This is a lockout. The employer is telling the employees they can't come to work. And labor experts tell me that that's a pretty aggressive bargaining tactic. How is this different than other stoppages we've seen in the past? Well, you know, uh, the last time that we had stoppages, um, they have been, uh, they have been, you know, some have been short, some have been longer. um, But really, uh, they this is that there are two companies at the same time. And what is the dispute about? Well, these talks have been tense, and after nine months, all sides still seem to be pretty far apart. The Teamsters Union represents nearly 10,000 workers, engineers, conductors, rail yard workers. Uh, They have tough schedules, and they're often on call. They say the companies want to gut protections around scheduling and rest periods, and that they're worried that that will compromise safety. The union also says CN is demanding more power to order workers to relocate across the country to fill labor shortages. On the other hand, both companies say that their offers do meet safety regulations and that they include competitive wage bumps that are in line with the industry. How big is this work stoppage? What is the impact it's going to have on Canadians? Well, already, you know, people are having to change their commutes this morning. More than 30,000 commuters feeling it as they try to get to work. Some transit lines in Toronto, Montreal and Vancouver run on CPKC tracks, and so those have been suspended. And depending on how long this shutdown goes on for, uh, shoppers could start to notice a difference on store shelves, especially when it comes to perishable goods. So you might not be able to get your hands on your favorite brand of frozen french fries. Uh, A lot of our fruits and veggies uh, that arrive from the U.S. and Mexico could be affected. And that could play out worse in Western and Atlantic Canada, which receive a lot of shipments by rail. And what industries will be hit most by this? Mining, manufacturing, agriculture, there's so much that we transport by rail. Paper, coal, fertilizer, beans, auto parts. You know, some businesses may try to get their products out on trucks, but for many, that's not a viable alternative compared to freight trains, especially when it comes to commodities. So we're already hearing from farmers that grain elevators are filling up, and if they can't deliver their grain, they can't get paid. Uh, That affects their investments for the next crop. You know, small business um, they are more vulnerable to kind of an, an unexpected event like this. They have less of a buffer. And when you're looking at the different sectors, a one-week rail disruption can often take six weeks to get things back on track. Mm-hmm. Labor Minister Steve McKinnon met with rail companies and with the union this week. We did request to speak with him but didn't hear back. What came from those meetings? He's really been urging the companies and the union 
to hammer out a deal at the bargaining table. There have been a lot of calls from business groups, from companies, for the federal government to impose binding arbitration. So far, the minister has been reluctant to intervene. You know, there are a lot of political dynamics at play here. But back in 2015, the Supreme Court issued a landmark ruling that all workers in Canada have the constitutional right to strike to resolve labor disputes. And so since then, the federal government has been more hands-off on negotiations like these. All right. Well, thank you very much for joining us, Nisha. You're so welcome. Nisha Patel is a senior business reporter with CBC News. Jonathan Abacassis is the Director of Public Affairs and Media Relations at CN Rail. He joins me now. Good morning. Good morning, Connie. Jonathan, why did you decide to lock out your employees? Well, without an agreement or binding arbitration, we had no choice but to finalize our safe and orderly shutdown and proceed with the lockout. We've been attempting to get an agreement with the Teamsters for the last nine months, And we've negotiated in good faith. We've consistently proposed serious offers with better pay, improved rests, and more predictable schedules. But the Teamsters haven't shown any urgency or any desire to reach a deal that's good for employees, the company, or the economy. What is the main sticking point for CN in these negotiations? Well, we've put forward offers that we think improve safety for employees and improve wages, improve everything, and offer our employees better work-life balance. The reality of it is that while the Teamsters say this is about safety and not wages, the very first page of their demands is entirely about wages. Uh, They're asking for signing bonuses. They're asking for $200 a day of allowance. They're also asking for uh, benefits for life for employees. So so quite frankly, it's leaving us a bit perplexed. Um, The union is asking also for better hours for workers um, because of concerns around safety. And they say um, it can increase the risk of fatigue-related issues. What's CN's take on that? That's simply not true. Uh, The offers that they have put forward don't get into that. The reality of it is that right now there are government-mandated work rest provisions that provide a framework. And this is a, a, these are provisions that were put together in collaboration with the union and that the union has publicly taken credit for, for lobbying for them. So it's all a bit confusing because the reality of it is that CN can't offer anything that's not within the framework of, that, of those rules. What are the hours your workers work? So right now, the way it depends very much on the, re- on the region, but... First thing to remember, Connie, is that employees are paid based on how many miles they run. They're not paid per hour. They also have no predictability into when they're going to work. What we've put forward as an offer is shift-based work, hourly wages of $75 an hour and $65 an hour, depending on the craft, as well as predictable breaks and predictable timing. In exchange, what we've asked for is more predictability for the company. It's like if you're running a restaurant, you show up in the morning and you don't know who's going to work and you just start calling people till somebody shows up. It's not a way to run a business. What we're asking for is the ability to have employees work an extra two hours currently based on what they currently work, which is absolutely within the framework of the government. The reality of it is that right now, we don't have the necessary labor availability to provide customers with the service that they're used to and the service that they need to move goods that power the Canadian economy. Uh, The Teamsters Union in their press release said the railroads don't care about farmers, small businesses, supply chains, or their own employees, that their sole focus is on boosting their bottom line. How do you respond to that? We have put together offers over the last nine months that have been good for everybody, especially the Canadian economy. The reality of it is that the Teamsters have shown absolutely no desire to reach a negotiated settlement and prefer to hold Canadian supply chains hostage. We think this is irresponsible, reckless, and needs to come to an end as quickly as possible, which is why yesterday we urged the the Teamsters to engage in these negotiations with the urgency and the importance that this situation requires. You met with the federal labour minister this week. What do you want to see from the government? We have asked the government to intervene for the simple reason that we don't think we have a partner to negotiate with. You can't make a deal with an empty chair, Connie. It's just that simple. So we've asked the government to intervene. Now, just to be clear, we haven't asked the government to tip the scales in favor of one party or another. We've asked for binding arbitration. 
That is when you ask a referee, a third party, to step in, consider the options in front of them, and make a decision that's going to go to a vote to employees. We think that that's fair, and we think that that's the path forward to avoid a labor stoppage that's going to have significant impact on the Canadian economy. We don't understand why the Teamsters are simply refusing to have a third party assess the situation and make a decision. I think that speaks more to the weakness of their position than it does to anything else. Well, this work stoppage is a lockout. What are you hoping to see in the next few days? We are going to keep trying to get a deal, but at this point, we don't know that it's possible. You need to have a willing partner at the other on the other side of the table. We hope the Teamsters will come to, to their senses and that they understand that this is not only impacting their members, but also Canadians everywhere, whether it's the tens of thousands of commuters that are stranded and have to find alternative plans to get to work, whether it's the sawmill workers in BC that were laid off, whether it's the people who are worried about their drinking water because we don't know if there's enough chlorine in certain municipalities, or whether it's the small business owner who has to make alternative shipping arrangements to get his goods quickly and safely to destination markets. Well, we'll have to leave it there. Thank you so much for joining us, Jonathan. Thank you, Connie. Jonathan Abacassis is the Director of Public Affairs and Media Relations at CN Railways. Joining me now is Christopher Manette, Director of Public Affairs for Teamsters Canada. Hello. Hello. Christopher, what's your response to what you just heard from Jonathan? Uh, There is a lot to unpack here from what I just heard. But first off, I'd like to start off by reminding everyone that we are dealing with an employer-driven work stoppage. Our members showed up to work today. They were locked out. They couldn't get in. They couldn't go operate those trains. They couldn't do the job they love because both companies, CN and CPKC, appear to have colluded to coordinate an, uh, to coordinate a simultaneous lockout, work stoppage, shutdown of the Canadian railway network in order to get concessions at the bargaining table. Both companies are coming after our fatigue protections in our collective agreement. You heard the company representative just now talk, saying that um, their offers meet uh, the uh, legal mi- the legal minimums, but that's just it. Our collective agreements provide protections that are superior to the federal minimum standards. Um, they ensure greater security, greater work life balance, more predictability for our members. Both of these companies are coming after these protections in our collective agreements that raise uh, fatigue related safety risk. And uh, they've claimed, essentially, that they're dealing with uh, uh, labor shortages, that they can't find people willing to work. Mm. Our response to that, quite frankly, is that it's not by trying to squeeze your employees even harder that you're going to find people willing to work. No, quite Mm. the contrary. It's by building up a more humane rail industry and by working to improve rather than roll back working conditions. Christopher, I know you're at the picket line right now, and that's the noise that we're, we're hearing behind you. But CN says that uh, that the Teamsters, that you weren't really at the table and are laying uh, the impact on industry and Canadians uh, on, at your feet. Um, what do, what do you, how do you respond to that? That is patently false. We've been negotiating now for nine months. We've been at the bargaining table uh for uh, over a week now, trying to get to a negotiated settlement with both companies. Uh, I would again go back to the point that this is an employer driven work stoppage where the main sticking points are company demands for concessions and not union proposals. Um, we have tabled several offers to the company, over, to both companies, CNN and CPKC, over the past uh, few days. Um, they uh, uh, sadly have not taken any of these offers seriously. Uh, We're trying to negotiate here. We're trying to get to an agreement. But it's really hard when we're dealing with two companies who are refusing to move forward unless we agree to gut our collective agreement of safety critical fatigue protections. Well, you've said that this is a safety issue. Um, you know, Jonathan has, has talked about uh, wages. What is the main sticking point for the Teamsters? The main sticking point are the company demands for concessions. So they're both coming after uh, protections we have in our collective agreement that help, uh, uh, that help workers ensure that they're rested and fit for duty when the call for work does come. Of course, as a union, I've got no shame telling you that we're going to try to get uh, uh, the biggest possible wage increases for our members. That, those type of conversations will happen in any round of collective bargaining. But if it was just about the wages, if it was just about the money, we probably wouldn't be having 
a conversation today. Well, we've just heard about the impacts ha- that are going to be felt across the country uh, from businesses and, and commuters. Uh, where do you go from here? Well, we want to get a deal with both companies, but the ball has been in their camp for quite some time now. Our members want to work. Uh, our members like their jobs. Uh, but uh, we, need to, uh, we need to have safe working conditions to do so. And uh, we need to be able, like everyone else, to incrementally improve our, uh, our, our, our lives uh, through, through our employment rather than start rolling things back and making things worse for, um, uh, for, for, for everything. Mm. Now, um, we want to be able to negotiate once again, uh, but I would remind commuters, I would remind farmers, I would remind small businesses or everybody who uh, relies on, on, on rail service that we are dealing once again with a lockout. The companies have basically told us that they don't want to negotiate, that they um, want to start putting pressure on workers mm-hmm. in order uh, for us to uh, basically to pressure us into agreeing to their demands. Okay. Thank you so much, Christopher. We appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Christopher Minette is the Director of Public Affairs for Teamsters Canada. Joining me now in studio is Dennis Darby. He is the President of the Industry Association Canadian Manufacturers and Exporters. Hello. Uh, good morning. So, Dennis, what are you hearing from your members this morning? Well, uh, actually, after what I just heard, I'm a lot, uh, a lot more depressed than I was probably even yesterday. Um, our members uh, have been saying for weeks uh, that shutting down the rail s- uh, service is going to cost them money, is going to cost uh, workers. Uh, it's about $500 million a day of just manufactured goods that travel on rail. It's, it, and most Canadians probably don't realize that. It's about half. And what that means is our ability to move goods to the States, move product in, move materials in. And the worry is very soon companies will run out of inventory of parts or ingredients, uh, and that will lead to, to layoffs or cut shifts. Um, we did a poll of our members across Canada, and they said on average they expect the strike to cost them about $275,000 a day. And what that is is penalties, delays. Uh, what happens, especially for manufacturing, where most mm-hmm. of our goods go to the U.S., is your customer charges you a penalty if you can't deliver. And the U.S. Uh, industry is not going to be very sympathetic to you know, Canada having this, a rail strike. Mm-hmm. So it's really, really important that we find a way, and we've been saying for, or, for weeks, find a way to get to keep the system running um, but it sounds this morning like it's not going to uh, it's not going to happen so right now everyone's you know sort of bear, bearing down waiting to see what happens next and what impacts should Canadians expect from this rail stoppage well for the first of all for the 1.8 million Canadians who work in the manufacturing sector you know there is the possibility over the next you know d- days and weeks that you, some companies will cut shifts and people will be laid off temporarily nope nobody wants to lay off anyone permanently mm-hmm. because of our very tight labor market. Uh, and there will be over time, you know, some things you won't maybe in short supply. Uh, that's what happened when um, when we had the port strike in in uh, in, uh, in mm-hmm. BC. So it's uh, an expectation that you know things that you expect to get on a regular basis right now maybe you know maybe you know maybe reduced. And uh, uh, it also affects our our reputation with the U.S. because of course our sector, our manufacturing sector, it's its principal mm-hmm. customer is the U.S. So it's Canadians are going to feel the pinch, but our partners in the States will as well. Federal ministers have been saying getting a deal is the responsibility of the union and the employer. What do you make of the approach they've taken? What do you want to see from the federal government? Well, I would argue that this, that even though it may not be essential from by the definition of the law, this is this is in the public interest. And we've said for you know some period of time when it looked like it didn't, it didn't seem that the two part the three parties, I guess, were coming to anywhere close to a deal. And we learned a lot more about that this morning, uh, that they should use the power they have uh, to, to force the parties back to the table. And we thought uh, binding arbitration is the right approach because what that does, it keeps the system working, keeps the workers working, keeps the goods moving, keeps our economy and our exports going while a, a deal is forced. And, and uh, I, I hope that that ultimately is what they do. Well, we've we've heard today on just how far apart uh, everyone is, so we'll have to wait and see, but appreciate you joining us today. Thank you. Dennis Darby is President of Canadian Manufacturers and Expor- Exporters.